what you will get out of it. You get one of these tools. You'll have a way of classifying text into multiple classes. And it, this particular example will be about classifying tweets, but the same code that you will develop, you could use it to classify blogs, um, you could use it for to classify emails automatically into different folders that you can define. Um, you could classify strands of RNA, you know, discrete strands and so on. So you could do a lot with that code. You essentially now have a classifier for multiple classes uh, and inputs. I have focused on inputs that are Bernoulli and I'm going to continue explaining, finish everything with Bernoulli input. The one thing I should though tell you is that you could quite easily define the naive bias classifier when the inputs are Gaussian. Because the, the maximum likelihood estimates and so on will be exactly what we did for regression. You will, um, you will still have discrete classes, but you're, you're just basically saying my inputs are distributed according to Gaussians as opposed to them being distributed according to Bernoulli's. Um, so the book of Kevin Murphy uh, actually treats that case. And actually, once you know how to do it for Bernoulli, and given that you know how to do Bayesian linear regression with Gaussians, you can just Google naive Bayes with Gaussian variables, and you'll see that you will be able to follow the equations. Because that's what this course is about. This course is about giving you enough tools that you could actually Google and understand what you find and be able to easily implement it. So can you also use this technique to classify images? Um, so for Im images are now continuous, you would treat images probably as continuous vectors. And so in that case, you need to define um, the, the variable over x, x is continuous, so you would use a Gaussian to describe it. Instead of using a product of Bernoulli's, you would use um, a single multivariate Gaussian. So That's the only difference. Better classifier than PCA? Right, so PCA is not a classifier. It's, oh, well, I PCA is an unsupervised learning, that's a good question. PCA is an unsupervised learning technique. What PCA did, did is it took images and it projected them to a lower dimensional space. But I, it, it did not address the issue of classifying them. It was clear that we could visualize it and then I, I argued that now it becomes easy to put a classifier. So what you do often in practice is you use PCA to project images to say 10D or 5D to a lower dimension, so to get rid of the noise. And then you fit the classifier to it. Okay. But instead of me spending more lectures teaching about how to do the naive based classifier when the inputs are Gaussian, which I think you will all be able to do it if you just read, let's say Kevin's book or any paper, if you just Google any paper online. Um, I'm rather going to focus in talking about how to classify images using other tools, logistic regression and neural networks and random forests. Those are the three other techniques I will cover in this course. I did mention k-means at the end of the course. I'm not sure if I will get to it. I would rather focus on make sure you understand the content of um, neural nets and random forests because they really are very popular right now and they're the techniques that are winning the competition. So I want you to learn those. Is this better for text and neural networks better for images or are you just teaching them as different examples? There are different classifiers. Um, this one is just extremely, so um, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves because I haven't taught you neural nets so I'm comparing against something I haven't taught yet. <laughs> but it will turn out that the neural nets will be a lot harder to optimize. Okay. This is extremely simple. The code, we saw what the code was. We just need to op uh, compute um, pi, which is what's the probability of class C, the prior probability of class C, and we need to compute theta, which is what's the probability that the word J is on in class C. Okay, so if the word is Viagra, what's the probability that Viagra appears in the class spam, and then you also learn what's the probability that the word Viagra appears in the class uh, respectable work. Um, and so just by learning these two probabilities, that's, this essentially is the coin probability. Except now instead of having one coin, we actually have d coins, one for each word. And we also then have d coins per class. 
So we have a total of C times D coins. But that's what the model is. It's just flipping many coins. And the advantage of this is this, this is, what word could I use to describe? Stupidly parallel. <laughs> because you could, when you need to count, you can just basically have machines counting. You know, if I need to count a bunch of numbers, I can just give you some, give him some, give him some. You each count, and then you give me your counts, and I just add your three counts. So it's an extremely parallel algorithm. Uh, moreover, every time I get a new training data set, I don't, need to, I don't need to load all the data in batch. I can do this online. Because every time I get a new one, I just need to add, update my counts. So I could do this online. Or what's common now, what people call the streaming model of learning. You have streaming data, and Twitter is indeed a stream. Twi Twitter is not a static data set. But this would allow us to learn from data that's always coming in, streaming. So there is this sort of forever learning. And that's very important for when you design web applications because you have customers interacting with your app and you have to assume that these customers will always be interacting with your app. So learning in a streamed version is useful. The only catch there I should put, there's a warning there. If you're learning always from your customers, make sure you don't have malicious customers. So often people, and, and indeed, Often people don't learn continuously from some customers because they know that there's some customers that will maliciously attack them. So they actually um, control, you know, the updates might not happen uh, in the milliseconds, but the updates might happen every few days or so. So there's other variables that, like malicious attacks are important. Okay, so that's the algorithm. And I argue that the maximum likelihood estimate is just you know, basically, just like the coins, it's the number of heads divided by the number of coin flips. Um, and that's what we have there um, as the estimates of the probabilities. So the only thing left now is for me to show you that this is indeed the case. Um, and so, and we have had made good progress because we had already written the expression for the log likelihood. Um, so once you have the log likelihood, the only th thing that is left for us to do is differentiate it and equate it to zero in order to get the estimates, right? And so in particular here, for each, for each class and for each word, I have a Bernoulli model, okay? Because I have theta, which is the probability of the word being on, of the jth word in class C being on, and one minus theta jc, which is the probability of it being off. Okay, so this is normalized, so I know that theta plus one minus theta gives me one. And so let's do that one first, because the first one is gonna be a bit tricky, but the second one is very easy because it's just a coin. Except that now, in this model, we actually don't have a, a single coin, but we happen to have capital C times uh, small d coins. Okay, so Let's do the MLE for theta. So the log likelihood that we had before, whoops, let me bring my pen first. So the log likelihood involving theta, so the log likelihood has two terms. It has a term that involves pi and it has a term that involves theta and they separate. So when I take derivatives, um, when, if I'm focused on theta, the derivative of the first term will be zero. And if I focus on pi, the derivative of the second term will be zero. So let's focus on theta, and let's just look at the term. Um, let's use a different L. This is just a term for theta, which is the sum from j equal one to t, and the sum from small c equal one to capital C. And for for the tweet, positive, negative, capital C is equal to two. Whereas small d is as many words as we have, maybe 10,000 words. And so w the expression I had in the previous slide was njc log theta jc, so I'm just copying verbatim what I had before, plus 
n c minus n j c times the log of the failure probability which is 1 minus theta j c okay so that that was the term for theta now let's take the derivative and I'm going to learn each coin separately so I'm going to take the derivative for coin JC and if I do that then I will have NJC times the derivative of the log of 1 of uh, 1 sorry log of theta JC which is just 1 over theta JC I have many more terms in the sum, but all those terms are for different j's and different c's, so the derivative will be zero for those guys. For example, if c is two, then the derivative with respect to theta when c is two will be captured by the term that I've written down, but the derivative with respect to theta whatever j one, where class is one, will be zero. Okay, because it's a different variable. It's not a variable with respect to which it's constant with respect to theta jc. Plus nc minus njc. And then using the same argument, um, this would be minus 1 over 1 minus theta jc, which is the derivative of this log. And so this is equal to njc times 1 minus theta jc plus and let's actually yeah let's do plus plus njc minus nc times theta j divided by theta j times 1 minus theta jc And then when I equate to zero, I get NJC minus NJC theta JC uh, plus NJC theta JC minus NC theta jc yeah equal to zero All right so now this term cancels with this because they subtract and I get that the estimate theta jc will just be equal to njc divided by nc which is what intuition would have told us is the right thing so it's a number of coin tosses in class C for word J and then the number of times you saw word J in class C divided by the number of times you you are in class C. Um, let me try to draw that C properly. All right, so when we do maximum likelihood, we recover what intuition tells us. Uh, we're just doing coin flips. You had a question. I think you can bracket those two terms while you're dividing, because I know you're saying the first term plus second term. Oh, one. yes. Uh, I, I was assuming this implicitly. But you're, you're right. To make this more clear, I could put a bracket there. But that's just easy algebra. We're just normalizing everything, equating to zero. Okay, so we get the right answer. There's no surprise here. If, uh, it's what I told you uh, a couple months ago. If you can do coins, you can actually do a lot of machine learning. So that's why we spend so much time doing the, the silly coin model. Alright, pi is a bit more interesting. So pi is this first term. So L of pi is equal to the sum 
actually, so that I don't have to page back. The sum over C of nc log by C. Okay, from small c equal 1 to big C, nc log of pi C, where pi C is the probability of class C, the prior probability. And we learn, we learn pi C, we learn the prior probability. And that in the end allows us to compute the posterior probability, which is what we care about. The posterior is what you use to decide whether the tweet is positive or negative. Okay. Now, here we have a problem. And our problem has to do with how I define the, uh, the categorical distribution. So let's look at the categorical distribution quickly. When I wrote down the categorical distribution, um, like for say xi, I said that all the thetas have to sum to 1. Like in this example that I did um, here, where I had three possible, so you essentially, is essentially think of it, um, a coin with three faces. Three things can happen. Um, and so you have the probability that the first thing will happen, the probability that the second thing will happen, and the probability that the third thing will happen, all denoted by theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. So of course, only one of those th three things will happen. So th theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3, uh, uh, you know, those things are all the things that could happen. So the sum of the probabilities should be 1. So when we sum the thetas, we should get 1. When I write the model like that as a product of a thetas, I have not put down the fact that I want my thetas to sum to 3. And I was just being easy with the notation. I didn't want to emphasize all the time that these thetas have to sum to 1. And I asked you to please just remember that the thetas have to sum to 1. Okay, so if, if you can be of k classes, your, your k thetas have to sum to 1. Um, Alternatively, in the binomial model, what I did is in the Bernoulli model, instead of uh, me telling you that um, you had theta 1 and theta 2, I actually already wrote it as 1. I wrote theta, instead of writing theta 2, I wrote 1 minus theta 1. So there was only one parameter, theta and 1 minus theta. So we avoided this problem. But here we do have a problem. We still need to somehow tell the algorithm that all the theta should sum to 1. And that's going to be an issue. The, the parameterization is not telling us that. So we need to add an extra thing to ensure that these theta sum to 1. And so in the cost function, this is sort of similar how the lasso also gets implemented, how we add the constraints. In the loss function, I'm going to add plus so I have this term, and I'm going to add another term with a weight lambda. We will learn what this weight is. At this stage, I don't know what lambda is. But we will figure out what lambda is. We're going to derive it. But I do somehow want to add this constraint that 1 minus the sum of, that the, sum of the pi c's has to be 1. My cost function should penalize me if the pi c's don't sum to 1. Okay, because I want all the pi's to sum to 1. <coughs> right? My models, my model, the first term is basically saying that my observations are of capital C classes. But it's not telling me that the sum of the pi c's has to be 1. That's why I need to add a second term. The second term is forcing the sum of the pi c's to be 1. I'm, I'm giving you sort of a sketchy version of this. If I actually go back and I start drawing contour plots and so on, I can actually derive this just like I derived the equations for lasso. But we're going to skip that for now because that gets a bit messy. And do we need to ensure that the second term is positive? Uh, we need to ensure that the second term vanishes. Okay. 
we need to ensure that the, pi, the sum of the pi c's will indeed be 1. If the sum of the pi c's is not 1, we haven't solved this properly. If it's approximately 1, it's not correct. But I will show you now. So in optimization, often it will be case that we will have variables and we will allow, there is this big topic of optimization with constraints and sometimes you will not satisfy the constraint exactly and things are still fine. You're able to do some sort of solution. And like if you do it like a nonlinear version of lasso, that's often the case. But in this case, it will turn out that the Pisces will sum to 1 when I do this, the, next, the derivation that I'm going to do next. So this is a fortuitous case. That's why I'm not going to bring in the heavy theory of constraint optimization. We don't need it in this case. I'm just requesting that the cost make sure that my pi c sum to 1. If it doesn't give me that, I will have to do more work. But if it does give me that, we are done. We have an algorithm that guarantees that the pi c's are 1 and that finds the maximum and that maximizes the first term, which is the likelihood. So it satisfies both things. It maximizes the likelihood subject to um, the parameters being uh, correctly specified. In other words, that they add up to one. Okay, let's take the derivative. Uh, the derivative of L, and now actually I'm going to call, I'm going to add the parameter lambda because I've essentially introduced another parameter. And if I introduce another parameter, I need to compute it. So how do I compute it? I take the derivative with respect to lambda and I equate to zero. If I do that, um, the first term doesn't depend on lambda, so the derivative is zero. And so the second term, I will just get 1 minus the sum of a small c to capital C of pi c. When I equate to zero, I get sum of a small c to capital C of pi c is equal to 1. Okay, that's good. My opt I, when my optimal lambda is attained, okay, when I achieve the optimum, I have the result that I want, the pi c sum to 1. But we are not done. Okay, we're now going to do this. So we're going to get nc times 1 over pi c when we take the derivative with respect to the c term in the sum. And we're going to have plus uh, lambda times minus pi c. Oh, sorry, minus 1. Okay, so I'm taking the derivative of the second term, which has 1 pi c times lambda, so I get uh, minus lambda. Okay, and from this, I get the equation when I equate to 0. So this would be equating to zero. That nc over pi c is equal to lambda. Okay. In other words, nc is equal to pi c times lambda. Okay. Just moving pi c to the other side. Now comes the trick. I'm going to sum, I have an equation, so an equality, so I can sum both sides over C. Actually, let me do this in a different color so that when you study this next time, it's clear what the steps were. I'm going to sum both sides over C. <coughs> If I sum all the number of times you fell in class C, I will get the total number, which is n equal. Lambda can come out. So 
So I get lambda times the sum over C equal 1 to capital C of pi C. So I'm summing both sides over C, the sum of all the number of, over all, so NC is the number of times you belong to class C, um, N is the total number of observations, so the number of, of positive plus the number of negative observations gives you the total number of observations which is small n, that's the left hand side. On the right hand side I've just taken lambda out of the sum and then I have the sum over the pi C's. But from result 1, which is this one, I now know that this is just equal to lambda times 1. In other words, I have learned that lambda must be equal to n. What's left now is to put it all together. So I have lambda is equal to n. So this is my final result. I have that lambda is equal to n. And I also have the fact that nc is equal to lambda times pi c. Therefore, pi c is just equal to nc over small n. Okay. The probability that you're positive is the number of times you are positive divided by the number of times you are positive plus the number of times you are negative, which is what you would expect from intuition. So Go ahead. On the second line, oh yes, thank you, I forgot that. So why would it the second step, I mean, differentiate with respect to lambda, because isn't that obvious that <coughs> sum of pi c needs to be 1? Oh, we wanted the sum of the pi c's to be 1 uh, by doing what we're going to do is we're going to optimize that experience. So, so this is the trick. Um, I don't know that my pi c is, pi c at this stage is just a parameter. Okay. I, and then I'm going to introduce a cost function that requires that the pi c sum to what? Okay. It might be that they will not sum to what? Uh, you know, beforehand I don't know cost function based on the fact that they should sum to 1? Yes, that they should sum to 1. Not that I know for sure already that they sum to 1. So I'm forcing them to sum to 1. I then so I introduce my cost function to ensure that the sum of pi c sums to 1. But in doing that, I have introduced this lambda parameter, which is the sort of trade-off between that regularizer, which in this case is actually a constraint on the probabilities, and, and the likelihood. I still now need to find what lambda is, and so that's why I take the derivative with respect to lambda, and that tells me that the pi c's are equal to what? This ensures that my, my reasoning is consistent. The sum with respect to lambda gives me that the pi c's are equal to one. That's a, that's a result that I get without me having forced the pi c's to be equal to one. I just force them by the cost. I force them in the cost function, but then the rest has to confirm okay. that I get. The cost function is a desire that the pi is be equal to 1. Fortunately, when I do the derivatives, I do get my desire satisfied and satisfied perfectly that they indeed do sum to 1 perfectly. They don't, they're not 0 0.999, no, they're 1 perfectly. So I'm fine. Go ahead. Um. If you had expressed this in the product before you took the log likelihood as the sum from i equals 1 to all your... I'm not even going to go there. It's... You can do it. It gets messy. There's a reason why we take logs. You're welcome to try this without logs. We can do it in office hours, but it's messy. I mean not to take the log. I mean to leave the last class as 1 minus the sum of the other classes without introducing the lambda. You can do it that way, actually. It, it, it's a bit more messy to do it that way as well. I know in previous courses I've actually taught it the other way, 
and it's a bit more tricky. This is cleaner. This, I mean, this, you know, this is as good as derivations get. Four lines and bam, you have the result. <laughs> I don't even need my extra page. I'll upload these slides today, by the way, and I fixed the issue with um, the video. So the two videos are now uploaded. Um, one of the problems was before the midterm, all of you were downloading these videos. And many of you actually hit multiple downloads, and somehow you actually managed to bring the web server down. <laughs> <laughs> there were thousands of requests, <laughs> which couldn't have been just as class. So uh, that's part of the reason why I'm trying expediently to move everything to YouTube. OK, so that's the maximum likelihood way of doing it. How do we do the Bayesian way? And the Bayesian way will allow us to deal with like the black swan paradox thing. We will allow us to deal with the fact that sometimes some words never appear. Okay, you might not have, um, or you did polls like very, co so the recent thing, if you've heard of Nate Sullivan in the New York Times, he was doing Bayesian modeling for the polls and so on to predict where the election would go. Uh, you could imagine that in some um, sections of the United States, uh, the probability of either Republican or Democrat would be zero. So if you don't do the Bayesian analysis properly, that could give you, uh, you would have the black swan paradox would affect you. You wouldn't get the right estimates. You would have zero probability events, which is what happened with some of the Fox presenters. They just uh, had zero probability events in their heads. Um, okay, so we need the Bayesian analysis to deal with the fact that sometimes you might not have observed the word, but that doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't assign some probability to it. You might not have seen the black swan ever for thousands of years, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All right, so um, in order to do uh, Bayesian inference, we, we do, it's just like the coin model, just like we did before. We have this likelihood, we will construct a prior. We multiply the prior times the likelihood, and that gives us the posterior. And in this case, the likelihood is the product of, so it's starting to get a bit more complex. Now the likelihood is a product of um, uh, D times C uh, Bernoulli coins uh, plus a product of, uh, or should I say times, uh, uh, a Dirichlet distribution over the class probabilities, the Pisces. Uh, but, um, sorry, a categorical distribution over the Pisces. The natural prior for the categorical distribution is the Dirichlet, and then the natural priors for the Bernoulli variables will be beta distribution. So, if we want to construct a prior, actually, let me do one more step here. So, this we agreed in the last class could be rewritten as the sum of a C equal 1 to big C of pi C to NC times the product from J equal 1 to D of theta NJC times 1 minus theta JC NC minus NJC. Okay, so that's a cleaner way of writing it when we just sum we just summed the number of times the, the you belong, the tweet was of class C, and then we sum the number of times word J appeared in class C and call it NJC. All right, so for pi, pi is a categorical distribution, so it makes sense to use a prior that is the Richelet. So my prior for pi for the vector pi will be proportional. I, I don't want to write these gamma functions, so I'm just going to write the proportional. It will be proportional to the product from small c to big C, pi c, and then my Dirichlet hyperparameters, alpha c minus 1. Okay, so we just use the Dirichlet prior.
likewise, my prior for theta jc, and I did forget one here, one index, my prior for theta jc, theta jc is a Bernoulli variable, so my prior should be a beta <coughs> prior, because I know the beta prior is conjugate to the Bernoulli likelihood already, so it's just going to be theta jc to the beta uh, and I'm just going to call it the beta beta 1 minus 1 and then theta um, 1 minus beta jc to beta 2 minus 1. So beta 1 and beta 2 are my hyperparameters and I have chosen those hyperparameters to be the same for all words. It's possible to make them different, but it turns out that if you make them the same, um, uh, that's good enough. So we basically are saying we have the same prior beliefs of each word of being on or off. This you have some freedom to change. You could change, you might want to say that you want to put more prior belief on the words Viagra being on, if you're worried about that. But if you just pick beta 1 and beta 2, 2 comma 2, 2 and 2, you, you'll be fine. We saw that that's a prior that already tends to work better than um, the, the maximum likelihood estimate. And you'll get to try this in your homework. And you'll verify, you could play with these parameters and, and see what works best. So, so that, in other words, I have D times C beta priors. Okay, one for each word in, in each class. Now, now that I have these D times C beta priors, and I have my capital C, there, uh, sorry, I have my one Dirichlet prior, I just multiply the priors to give me the sort of the joint prior. Okay, a priori I believe everything is independent, so I just multiply it and that gives me a single independent prior. And so my prior over pi and theta will be equal to the product from c equal 1 to big C of pi c alpha c minus 1 times the product from j equal 1 to d of theta j c to the beta 1 minus 1 times 1 minus theta jc to the beta 2 minus 1. Okay. And just to make something a bit more clear, um, everything here is inside a sum, the product of a c. So. And as you can see, my likelihood and my prior have the same shape. the product of a C and then I have a pi C and then I have a product of a D and then I have my theta times 1 minus theta. So when I multiply them because they have the same shape, I just need to sum the exponents. And that's my posterior. Just like with the coin model. So that I'm going to do in the next page. So my posterior over theta and pi given the data, which is x and y, is proportional to the product of from c equal 1 to big C, and then I multiply the pi c, so one exponent is alpha c minus 1, the other exponent is nc, so I just add those two. So it's pi c to nc plus alpha c minus 1 times the product from j equal 1 to d <coughs> and then I do the same thing I have my theta jc and then I have my 1 minus theta jc and I just need now to add the exponents so the exponent is beta 1 plus nc minus njc 
No. Sorry. Um, this guy. And then this guy goes with that guy. So beta 1 plus NJC minus 1. And this one here is beta 2 plus NC minus NJC minus 1. And we're done. The posterior is a Dirichlet distribution. And then basically it's a Dirich layer which has a new alpha. This is the alpha of the posterior and this is sort of the, the new beta prime and this is the new beta 2 prime. Just like for the coin model, it's the same. We multiply the two, we add the exponents. And we're done. The posterior is Dirich layer and we know the expression of the mean of the Dirich layer. So if I ask you what might I ask you? Yeah, the means. So the mean of pi, uh, the mean estimate of pi will then just be, just reading it off Wikipedia, nc plus alpha c divided by n. and plus the sum of, uh, you know, the normalization constant. So. And likewise, the mean, the posterior mean, so the posterior mean estimate of theta jc It's just equal to NJC plus uh, beta 1 divided by NC plus beta 1 plus beta 2. Okay. What's C dash? C prime? C prime? Oh, C is a dummy variable because it's in a sum. I just made it prime to make it not be the same C as the top. It, it, it doesn't matter. If that confuses you, just forget that there is a prime there. It's, it's a, from one to C, right? Yeah, so it doesn't, that's what that sum means. What is the shape of the digital curve of the Oh, good question. So, I don't have a plot for you, uh, I could describe this with words, uh, but let me, instead of describing it with words, because we're done, um, before I describe it for you, um, just a consequence here is, um, it will be basically like, think of it as like the beta, cause it, but think of the beta in 2D. So it could also be a bell, it could also be spiky, and it could also be the uniform distribution. Okay. So if I choose, in particular, if I choose my parameters beta 1, beta, um, beta 1 and beta 2 um, to be equal to 0, I recover the maximum likelihood estimates okay. um, in this case. So we're, we're back to getting exactly the same things that we were getting before. Because we are using mean as an estimate of the distribution, so is that an appropriate choice? It, it is in this case, but it shouldn't. But it's a very good question because sometimes you might want to use the mode, and the mode you would just subtract minus one from it. So instead of uh, let's Dirich uh, layer distribution images. <laughs> there you are. That's what it looks like. And there's a, 
a few pictures of the Dirichlet distribution. So think of it as like the beta distribution, but in this case, the beta distribution is in, uh, in 2D. Sometimes, so it's, it's unimodal, basically. That's part of the reason why the mean makes sense. But even with a beta distribution, the mean doesn't make sense all the time. I mean, even the beta distribution, uh, the beta distribution might look like this. The Dirichlet is kind of like this, but in 2D. Um, and so you might not want the mean. This is kind of like the histogram of your marks. The mean might not be informative. You might want to believe better on the mode, which is the peak. And this now is your choice, which estimate you want. For the Bayesians, the, the, the full posterior is the solution. Um, and then if you want to compute a particular estimate, I can give you many estimates. I can give you the mean, I can give you the mode, I can give you the median, um, and so on. And I can also give you the... Comp We've actually done a lot more than just computing one of these values. We computed the full thing. We computed the distribution. Um, another way of representing these... Um, oh, here's, here's a good plot when, um, actually this is a very good one. So this one shows you three situations. When it's very informative, when beta 1, sorry, when, uh, for the Dirichlet distribution. When all the alphas are positive, say all the alphas are equal to 2, um, you get the guy on the right hand side, or in fact the, the label tells you. That's actually when all the alphas are say 10, you get the guy on the right hand side. When all the alphas are 1, you get the uniform distribution. And when you alpha is smaller, just like for the beta distribution, when uh, we get this. So this was when, when we were about 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. We would, uh, we would get these uh, tailing off at the boundaries at 0 and 1, asymptoting at 0 and 1. So it's exactly the same as the plot we had for the beta distribution, except that it's in 2D. The reason why it's a triangle is because um, it's enforcing that you have a probabilistic simplex, that the, the three parameters sum to one. <coughs> so any point inside that triangle is such that it can be triangulated by, you know, by the three coordinates sum to one. And that's essentially the Dirichlet. It's pretty much the beat. But like in that situation, the mean starts making less sense. But, so, but typically, we will be in this regime on the right hand side. So, whether we go with the mod or the mean or some other statistics it depends on the choice of alpha values? It depends on the if choice. If I choose different alpha values, I'll have different sort of digital distributions, right? That's correct. So, and depending on that, I should go with a different approximation, like a median or a mode or something? Not an approximation, it's an estimate. estimate. So, there's no approximation there. Um, no, the estimate just, you can use the posterior mean. If you want to make predictions, you actually need to integrate over all the, over the entire posterior. When you do that integration, it turns out that you get the posterior mean. But that's, um, that's a topic that I didn't touch into um, sort of future work. Um, I had promised, so we're done with it. So you can now basically go and implement it. You got the estimates, the two estimates. Uh, the homework will be due in like in two weeks. I'm going to give you enough time because I don't want to affect your... By the way, there will be two more.